Good morning. Welcome to First Universalist Unitarian Church. My name is Jim Moss. I'm a member of this congregation. I want to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us today. Do we have any? Yeah, we've got a few. See at coffee. Since 1858, UU Wassa has served as a vital voice for liberal religion in central Wisconsin. We are an intentionally free society that welcomes all people just as you are, regardless of age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, or economic situation. Wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. Between Sundays, we'd love to have you at one of our classes or events. Be sure to subscribe to the church's newsletter and follow us on Facebook or Instagram for updates. There are a few announcements I want to bring your attention to. There's a community focus collection on the third weekend of each month. Our Sunday collection will be given to a selected ministry partner that puts our mission statement into practice. Uh, somebody's going to give us more information on that. Um, volunteers are an essential part of any community and our church is no exception. On March 30th, there's an opportunity to help set up Easter flowers in the church. This task adds to the beauty of the church during the season. Additionally, on April 9, you can participate in the American Red Cross blood drive as a volunteer or a blood donor. I've done that and it's very easy. UU Family Fun Day. Today after the service, everyone is invited to join the RE team in Yawkey Hall for their third UU Family Fun Day. During last year's RE visioning groups, one thing we consistently heard was people wanted more connection, especially across and between the generations. And this UU Family Fun Day will be an opportunity for all ages to create and connect with a fun Easter-themed art project that will get us thinking inside the box. No skills or artistic ability needed. And all supplies and snacks will be provided. See the insert in your bulletin for more information about the project and UU Family Fun Days. For more details on the events I, annou I announced, please read our Circuit Writer newsletter, visit our Facebook page, or visit the church website. You can also contact the Congregational Administrator directly via email at well, um, the address is in your uh, order of service, I believe. Please silence any electronic devices. Now as we begin worship together, let us take a moment to extend peace and blessings to one another. Please rise and greet your neighbors. All right, friends, let us gather our hearts and minds for worship. The chalice lighting words are in the order of service. 
We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the fire of commitment. We light this symbol of our faith as we gather together. Please rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, 298, Wake Now Our Sense, My, my, my Senses. This morning I'd like to share with you a story of one of our more recent Unitarian Universalist ancestors, Clyde Tombaugh. Our story begins with Clyde just finishing his farm chores, and now he was free to spend the rest of the evening doing his favorite thing, stargazing. He got out his telescope and he looked up into the night sky, and while he looked at the moon and stars, he wondered about the mysteries of the universe. As he looked at the universe, he may have wondered, does any other planet have life? Are there aliens out there somewhere? How could we communicate with them? What would they be like? Could we live on another planet? Or you can put your own questions about the mysteries of the universe here. Clyde was filled with curiosity and questions, and the telescope he had wasn't strong enough to get the answers he wanted. He wanted to see more, and he wanted to see things more clearly. So he decided to build his own telescope. He searched his parents' farm for old pieces of machinery that he could use. He painstakingly ground mirrors for their reflective powers. His father lent him a shaft from his car. With these materials, Clyde made himself a powerful telescope. Now he could see in much more detail when he watched the planets. He drew pictures of what he saw, but he wanted to know more. So he sent his drawings of Jupiter and Mars to astron astronomers. 
He hoped they'd give him some information. Instead, they were so impressed with his pictures that even though Clyde had not gone to college yet, they offered him a job. Another scientist, Percival Lowell, was sure there was another planet farther away from Earth than Neptune, but so far no one had been able to find it. So Clyde went to New Mexico, and he spent every night in an unheated observatory looking through the telescope for Planet X and taking pictures of the sky. Through the long, cold nights, Clyde tried to glimpse the new planet. Later in life, he liked to say, I've really had a tour of the heavens. Finally, when he was 24 years old, Clyde took a photograph of the night sky that showed a strange shifting light. There was a planet beyond Neptune. He had found Planet X. The new planet was named Pluto for the Roman god of the underworld. All his life, Clyde loved learning about the universe. Over the years, he discovered more than 100 asteroids, a comet, a supercluster of galaxies. He thought exploring and learning were so important that he became an astronomy teacher. He helped other people investigate the sky, sometimes using the huge two-story telescope he built in his own backyard. And he loved learning so much that he and his wife helped found the Unitarian Universalist Church where they lived in New Mexico. Clyde knew a congregation, like an observatory, could be a very good place to seek truth. Clyde died a very old man in 1997, but our story does not end there. You see, now scientists have decided Pluto isn't really a planet after all. And if you ask any millennial who was taught the pneumatic device, my very excellent mother just sent us nine pizzas, they will tell you Pluto was robbed. <laughs> but scientists voted and agreed on three rules to determine what object in space was a planet. And it had to orbit around the sun. It must be large enough the surface becomes round and smooth, and it must be large enough to clear other objects out of its orbit. orbit. Pluto does not meet these new rules. It's too small. Clyde's wife, Patricia, said Clyde would have been disappointed with the vote, but as a scientist, he would have understood. When we seek truth, when we wonder about the mysteries of the universe, it feels good to make discoveries and find answers. But Clyde knew what's most important is to keep asking questions. And that is our story for today. This morning, our preschoolers through sixth graders are invited downstairs for our children's chapel. And youth group, which is seventh through 12th grade, is invited to go hang out in the owl room, which is on the first floor for their Connections Cafe. And whether you are heading off to an RE group or remaining in worship, I invite you to bless everyone here with our children's song. The words are printed in your order of worship. I'd like to invite everyone to join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation. We'll start by finding a nice, relaxed, seated position. If your legs are crossed, I invite you to uncross them and put them firm and flat on the ground. If you're comfortable closing your eyes, it's a good time to close them. Let your awareness settle into this sacred space. Take a full breath into your chest and slow out. Notice any tension in your jaw or your stomach. Take another deep, full breath and let it all out. Let us pray. Holy life, holy breath, holy mystery. Be gracious to us, for the world is in distress. People waste away from grief, 
soul and body. Too many lives are spent with sorrow, too many years with sighing. The strength of many fails because of misery. We pray for those who feel like they're hated and for those who are hated by their adversaries. We pray for people who have no neighbors. We pray for those who have passed out of mind as if they were already dead, for those who live broken with terror all around. But we trust in you, O Spirit of life, that time is in your hand. Deliver people from the hand of their enemies. This hour we pray that goodness and grace will shine upon all creation and that wholeness and peace will be within us, among us, and around us. Now call to mind the joys and sorrows in your lives and let us meditate on them in silence together now. Amen. Stay seated and open the gray hymnals to 100. I've got peace like a river. <laughs>
Okay, you're on deck. <laughs> we know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are grateful for this and commit together to ensure funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they could have alone. Good morning. Joy is sitting over there, kind of twisted my arm a little bit. She thought maybe you'd heard her voice too many times. So I'm up here to thank you for your continued support for New Beginnings for Refugees. We are really very, very grateful for all of your donations. And uh, since I'm sure Joyce has informed you of what we do, I would like to just give you an update of what is going on. Since ECDC, the Resettlement Agency, works with the Federal State Department, we go by the federal uh, fiscal year, which began October 1st. Since that time, the Wausau office has processed 76 individuals, and we have put together in our pantry about 30 house kits, 14 of them in the last month and a half, so we've been really busy. We have three large families and three single women coming this week, and we have two more house kits that we need to assemble before they get here. There are presently 260 individual, uh, individuals in, West, in central Wisconsin who have been or are clients of ECDC. There are 71 households in Wausau, 14 in Stevens Point, one in Wisconsin Rapids, and 16 in Barron and the western part of the state. New Beginnings does not service the people in Wisconsin Rapids or Barron. We have been doing most of the house kits for Stevens Point, but they have not used our pantry for shopping. Uh, ECDC is trying to get a group together to uh, gather goods and assemble kits for those who are going to be uh, further settled in Stevens Point. A breakdown of the nationalities who have come, including children, is 91 Afghans, 78 Congolese, 44 Burmese, 9 Burundians, 6 from Central Africa, 4 Syrians, 3 Venezuelans, 25 from Somali, 1 from Sudan, and those from Somalia and Sudan have been settled in Barron, where there is a, a community of those nationalities. Right now, there are 107 pending arrivals, not all of whom will be uh, settled in, in Wausau. There are changes going on at our New Beginnings Pantry. Our new neighbor patrons are now allowed use of the pantry for a maximum of two years. We will be open as usual twice a month for shoppers. However, they are only eligible to use it once a month. Donations have not kept up with the increasing demand, so we have had to make these changes. Our pantry will also start the process of moving this week. The New Beginnings office and English language classrooms have moved from the second to the third floor in the Third Street Lifestyle Center. Our pantry will occupy an extra room in that office suite, making it more convenient for patrons. The first Saturday of the month household goods donation drop-off will move from First Presbyterian Church 
to the old Penny's building loading dock where furniture donations are also accepted. Lastly, New Beginnings, a nonprofit, has only two employees, our English language learner director and our executive director who wears way too many hats, so marketing and publicity take a back seat. We would be really appreciated, uh, appreciative if you would help us out by telling your family and friends about our fundraiser coming up at the Grand Theater on Tuesday evening, April 16th. There will be raffles and a free movie, The Swimmers. I haven't seen the movie, but Joyce has, and she highly recommends it. She says it's a wonderful film. After the movie, a man from Syria will be speaking. It sounds like a wonderful evening, and donations will be greatly accepted. Thank you so much for all you have been doing. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation and the refugee pantry. May we give in love and hope. The mission and ministry of UUWASA is made possible by the general support of our friends and neighbors and members. You may place a gift in the plate as it passes by. The offering will now be received. This morning's reading is a poem entitled The Journey by Mary Oliver. The poet writes, One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend your life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations through their very melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough 
and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left your voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there is a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. And that voice kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. There it ends our reading. So my first real romantic kiss occurred in the winter of 1998 in the darkened cinema of Carasota Showplace 4 during the 10 o'clock showing of James Cameron's romantic disaster film, Titanic. I started holding Becky's hand around the time that the poor orphan boy Jack Dawson played Duh by Leo DiCaprio. 
snuck his way on board and wooed the high-class Rose DeWitt Bukaber, played by Kate Winslet, of course. By the time Jack and Rose stood at the ship's bow for the famous King of the World scene, which occurs 88 minutes approximately into the film, we were still holding hands. As you might imagine, our clasped palms had created their own atmosphere, <laughs> which resembled Atlanta in mid-July. <laughs> but as anyone who has been on a teenaged first date knows, proximity is nine-tenths of the gig, and so I was not going to let go of Becky's hands until the lights came back on or someone pulled the fire alarm. And so as I was starting to rub a cramp in my forearm from the strain of holding someone's hand for nearly two hours, Becky started to lean over and I knew, this is my moment. I thought I was about to have my first kiss, tongue and all. And so as I leaned over, I awkwardly puckered my lips and opened my mouth at the exact same time, and Becky whispered to me, my arm hurts. I sat there acting like I wasn't drying my hand on my jeans as hundreds, hundreds of men, women, and children jumped from the fiery deck of the Titanic to their death in the cold waters of the Atlantic below. But I figured, I figured that the most tragic moment of the film was about as good a time as any day to pray for guidance so that God could tell me the perfect moment to lean towards Becky and initiate the magical moment of our first kiss. And then, as Leo breathed his final breaths and dear Kate lay atop a floating wooden door, romance sparked. I leaned over and I commenced the third worst first kiss in the history of kisses. I hadn't had braces yet, and so my crooked teeth smacked right into Becky's braces. I had made this last-minute decision to not swallow my gum, which I then accidentally inhaled. And then two popcorn kernels dislodged from my wisdom teeth. But it happened. The whole focus of the universe narrowed on the two of us. And when it was over, I opened my eyes, and there she was, the girl of my dreams for about three more weeks. <laughs> All right, so now that we're thinking about our first kiss, on the count of three, everybody call to mind the first person you kissed romantically. Do you have their name in your head? On the count of three, everybody just speak their name into this sacred space. <laughs> One, two, three. Hallelujah. <laughs> get, get, hallelujah. So when I think back on that memory, pre-anxious for my own teenage daughter's first dates, I remember how magical and how mysterious it felt. A first kiss, right? Feeling yourself fall in love or discovering music that hits all your perfect notes. It's easiest, at least it seems to me, to just call moments like that Magic. To try and explain why you love someone, if you try it, it always ends up falling apart the instant you get started. Here are a couple examples. Because she's beautiful and smart and patient and forgiving, it all just eventually trails away into an awareness that as much as you think you know, you don't. Or if you think about music, because the way the guitars and the lyrics and the silence merge, it always ends up, in the end, wishing you could just put that record on for someone else and they could feel exactly what you feel. I tend to think that what makes the music and the art and the people we love so special is the mystery, a realization that some things are just impossible to explain. And so there's this classic ideal in theology that gets at this very idea. It says that the reason we can't ever fully know someone, 
why we can't fully comprehend our own thoughts, much less anyone else's, is because if we were able to do that, we would be comprehending God, and you can't comprehend God. So the late Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, he touches on this idea when he says, and this is a quote, understanding means throwing away your knowledge, end quote. So what he's suggesting here is that our preconceived notions sometimes limit our ability to understand others and understand ourselves. And so the point, or perhaps the challenge, is to let go of our assumptions so that a deeper understanding might slowly emerge. And so one of religion's key contributions to life, but especially to art and to writing, has been its mission to bear witness to that irreducible complexity and mystery in other human beings. Human beings who are always more than the labels we give them. People who always overflow our perceptions and stereotypes, and they always evade our takes and our categorization. And so this leads me to a question I want all of you to consider this morning. Are you ready for your question? What would you rather have, knowing and understanding, or loving and being loved? Here's your question again. What would you rather have, knowing and understanding, or loving and being loved? A hundred times out of a hundred, learned, by the way, my answer is loving and being loved. And I'll tell you why. Almost all of the most important things about me have come as a result of love. So in order to achieve my potential, if, I, if I've even done that, especially after years of living like the prodigal son in very, very dissolute living, people who love me, they showed me another way and they convinced me I was capable. Or take to become a minister. To become a minister, now first, of course, I needed a seminary education because that's what churches like this expect ministers like me to get. But the real education I received in order to be a minister came from visiting people at home and in hospital rooms and marrying and burying and praying with them. And so if you're unsatisfied with those answers, Consider that there's a theory of education that says the point and purpose of teaching isn't to transfer knowledge, but to accompany someone as you show them how to transform their attention. If you'd like a concrete example of what I'm trying to say, here it is. Ask any kid who their favorite school teacher is or was. The answer you'll get is this. It'll never be the teacher who knows all the facts and the figures. It's always the teacher who saw something in the kid that the kid didn't see in herself. The teacher who made that child laugh and feel comfortable and feel alive. And so I become converted to this idea about education that says the best of what we know is ultimately an alignment of our love. And so as this theory goes, what teaching is all about, what learning is all about, is the alignment of love. Now that might sound a bit out there, that might sound a little too Unitarian even for this pulpit, but it's not. Three psychiatrists recently wrote a book on it with the crux of the entire book coming down to this observation, which I'll quote, who we are and who we become depends in part on whom we love. Now, I don't think that this quote needs very much explaining because I find it to be just that intuitive. But I do think that the science behind the quote needs just a couple sentences. And so the short version is that the legacy of humankind is that we have this ability to revise our limbic system. That complex part way back in the back of your brains where emotions and motivations and your memories are kept. And so the idea suggests that there is always something more in a moment, always something more in a person. It resists any attempt at accepting or seeking a stance that asserts the world and everything in it is, dis is discovered by laws and principles. 
I'm going to say that again. It resists any attempt at accepting or seeking a stance that asserts that the world and everything in it is governed by discoverable laws and principles. It's a bit mysterious. The general theory of love says that in life's magical moments, there is always a fuller reality that exceeds what you're able to see or perceive with your senses. It's not that it's on top of or beyond. What they're saying is that it's within the very life we're living. So what got me thinking about all of this was an article by, of all people, a jazz critic named Ted Goya. He wrote this great piece a while back on what guides his life. And the last topic he said that guides his life is spirit. Now bear in mind that Goya isn't a Christian. I don't even think he's a theist, as far as I can tell. But what he said I find very interesting. Here's what he said, quote, We live in soul-starved times. Soul-starved times. But I have faith in a force that's bigger than my own whims and desires. I remain hopeful that I can align my own life more closely with this higher power. And the single biggest way I have of realizing this is by treating others charitably as fellow sojourners in this larger creation. So after I read this, I started to wonder if faith isn't just a source of solace, but rather that faith is a challenge to a life that we're always in the end going to fall somewhat short of. It's something like a burst of happiness that fades the moment you acknowledge it. And it's not because we're deficient or life is deficient, but because the gift of faith is that it offers a way of life. It's always pointing in a direction we're going, a way to feed our own and others' starving souls. And so if we follow this line of thinking, what we might end up saying is that religion is seldom about belief. After all, you can find evidence of this in the Gospel of John. If you listen to the words of Jesus, Jesus never says, believe in me. What Jesus says is, quote, do as I have done. Do as I have done. By the way, if you want to know, he says that right after washing his friend's feet who are about to betray him. And knowing that this is going to happen, he elaborates and he says, you need to be more present to your neighbors and you need to be more conscious of the world around you. Elsewhere in religion, the Buddha says almost the exact same thing. Here's what he said, quote, when you find that anything is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, accept it and live up to it, end quote. And so, yes, what both of these quotes are saying is, yes, take the time to look into things, but ultimately our religious calling is to do, is to be, and is to live. Live the best you can. Seek the best in people. And be love without reserve. And maybe, and perhaps most of all, accept that there isn't a person on planet Earth who doesn't have pain inside them. In my men's group last week, one of the smarter guys in the group reminded all of us that the pain of being human that isn't transformed always ends up being transmitted. And what's always transmitted, the way that we always transmit this is we transmit it through our vanity, our anxiety, our meanness, and our jealousy. It's transmitted through our media's oversaturation with people who I call authoritative explainers. People who pretend to have all the answers. People who try to turn down the dimmer of the lights in your life. But the thing is, is we even do this to ourselves. Some of us want so desperately to be liked, and so we change who we are. Some of us pretend to like things we don't even like to get people to like us. Or we do things that in the long run, we end up regretting. I have this dear friend of mine who told me that she watched five seasons of NFL football 
praying every Sunday that her boyfriend might turn over and ask her one day if maybe she wanted to pick something to watch on Sunday afternoons for a change. He never did. That's not what love is supposed to be. As Maya Angelou said, quote, love liberates. It doesn't just hold what holds is the ego. Love never binds. Love says, I love you. I love you if you're in China. I love you if you're across town. I love you if you're in Harlem. I love you. I would like to be near you. I would like to have your arms around me. And I'd like to have your voice in my ear. Love liberates the soul. Those are her words. Now the world and a few pesky people in it, they will try to enslave your soul. They will try and dim your light and they will try and quiet your song. But the gift and mystery of love is that it cannot and will not be bound. It's a force that shapes life. It never limits it. And this is what God is. That which is greater than all and present in each. We find our true worth not in the definitions others give us, but in all the ways we transcend the labels we're handed. All the ways that we wrestle our self-doubt. And so the work of religion is to liberate hearts. As someone wise once said, All love's gravity and all of its grace are found in acts of attention. If our attention is focused on armoring our hearts, it's true they might never be broken. But in the end, what an armored heart only does is it protects itself from the only thing worth living for. And it's in the here and the now that we live and we love. It's in the here and the now that we get to kiss in dimly lit theaters. It's in the here and the now that we teach and we're taught, that we get to unwrap the present and receive it for the gift that it is. A mystery, our very own work in progress that yes, it winds through shadowed filled valleys, but those valleys are always riddled with light. Amen. Let us rise now and sing closing hymn number 301 in the gray book, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky.
If you would, I invite you to reach out with your heart. If you're here with someone or nearby, reach out and take their hand. May the truth that sets us free and the hope that never dies and the love that casts out fear lead us forward together until the day spring breaks and all shadows flee away. Please have a seat. Enjoy the postlude.